The message I want to share with you tonight is entitled Finding Happiness in Life. And it's not some cutesy little formula, but it's a, it's a set of principles that will help guide us. Um, how many of you want to stay happy in life? Now, we're going to have our frustrations. We're going to have nightmares. We're going to have some bad days along the way. But generally speaking, the Lord has his principles built into his word by which we can find happiness in life. And by the way, we want to welcome back Mario Santiago. Mario. <laughs> wow, man. Mario was gone for two weeks on a missions trip with Dr. Ferris to Trinidad. It's good to have you back, brother. I bet you're glad to be back, aren't you? Yeah. And Kathy's more glad than both of us that you're back. All right. Praise God. Welcome back home, Mario. All right. So we're going to be coming out of the book of Psalms tonight, particularly in Psalm 1 as we study this. We want to be able to pull out from the book uh, of Psalms the truths that God has. And we're going to pray that as we study his word, he's going to breathe life into us. We're going to feel the sense of his presence. We're going to feel the strength of his word go on the inside of us and give us understanding. And he's going to breathe into our lives, breathe into our futures, breathe into our families, and give us understanding. You know, the book of Psalms is so powerful in that the writers of the Psalms uh, were used mightily by God because what was written uh, two or 3,000 years ago is still speaking to us in a very powerful way. The book of Psalms, all the Psalms are filled not only with truth, they're filled not only with insight, they're filled not only with instruction, but they are filled with emotion. Because a lot of it is captured in David's life and in the life of Moses and other writers of the Psalms uh, when their lives were in terrible places, when they were threatened, when their lives were threatened, when they were hopeless, and also when they were filled with new hope. And so it runs the full gamut of emotions that are captured as we read the book of Psalms, because Psalms will always give place to our feelings. We will always see our feelings reflected somewhere as we read the Psalms. Um, because expressing your emotions can be frustrating, especially when you're seeking a spiritually balanced life, where we're wrestling with emotions, we're wrestling with feelings, we're wrestling with circumstances and situations, and yet we're trying to stay in faith at the same time. So where is that line drawn between, am I in faith, am I out of faith? I feel like crying, and yet I'm supposed to be strong. The Lord said he'll strengthen me, but I'm not feeling it tonight. Anybody ever been there? If not, here's the good news, you will be. So, so then you're getting a preemptive dose of good medication tonight. And... Psalms will give a voice to all those feelings. You know, should my feelings be up or should I be down? What does it mean to be spiritually strong? What does that look like? Does it mean I never have a bad day? Does it mean that I always feel at the top of my game? And, well, of course, the answer is no to all those things. A real spiritual person draws their strength from the Holy Spirit and yet knows how to live a real life in the between. Not whining all over the place, but not living in denial at the same time. <laughs> so how are you doing today? You really want to know? No. <laughs> Honestly, no. Because I know when somebody says that, they're generally not even trying to go deeper. They're generally not even trying to go deeper. What they want to do is simply vent. And guess what? When they vent to you, the next 15 people that approach him will also get the same dose. And that's not where it's at. I'm not trying to deny reality, but that's not how you get healing. Wow. You still glad you came? All right, it's early on in the game. Give me a chance. No. Okay, so all this range of emotions were at the top of our game, and then those, those occasions, as we read so many times in the Psalms, where the psalm writer feels, doesn't mean it's real or reality, they feel abandoned by God. And they're asking, Lord, where are you? And then I think it's in Psalm 33 or 35, where David said, Lord, my enemies are too strong for me. I feel absolutely overwhelmed. 
And all these things, they're real people in real situations that the Holy Spirit captured for us to learn from. Um, so why did these psalmists, Moses and David and Solomon, write, why did they write these songs? And a lot of them were poems. And a lot of these things were um, not only read, but they were sung in Solomon's temple. We read them as psalms, but they were really uh, prayers set to music. And they're beautiful things. So why did these guys write these things for us? Well, I'll tell you what. It was to urge us on in spiritual encouragement. It was to urge us on. It was to provoke us to love and good works, as it says in Hebrews 10. Right? Because I'll tell you what, when the, when the nation of Israel would march into battle, they would sing songs of encouragement to remind them. Guess what they would remind them, be reminding each other of? Keeping the Lord first in their lives and remembering what he had done in times past. And they would sing these psalms, and they would be psalms of encouragement to the armies that are ready to engage in physical battle. And what, what they would be reflecting on is not how well we've trained, not remember to strike low and then go the second shot high with your sword. No, it was reflecting on God's past faithfulness when they're getting ready to face a new challenge in life. Hey, we do well to learn from that. Because when the Lord answers prayer, how many of you know that that's something that we need to remember? Now, it may seem like a small answer to a small prayer, but there's no such thing as something small and something large from God's standpoint. Any prayer that gets answered is in itself miraculous. Because you're getting an answer from a God whom you cannot see into a realm that you can see in. How do you figure that out? How do you possibly make sense of that? You can't. It's a supernatural thing. Amen. And he says, remember all those things. They're all very, very important. So, so today, the psalmist is going to speak in, deep into our lives. Tonight, you may be going through all sorts of emotions. Maybe you're in a crisis. Maybe you're in a great place. Maybe you're in a mediocre place. Maybe you're coming out of a bad place and into something new. Anyhow, whatever emotions you're going through, the psalmist wants us to grab hold of the promises of God today and not let go. He wants us to find happiness in him. So let's read at the top of our outlines here. And ushers, make sure that's on 71. All right, Mark? Thanks. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. I guess it feels like a kosher deli in here sometimes. I don't... Okay. <laughs> and after what some of you have eaten, it smells like it too, I guess. Sometimes. I'm just, I don't know. Just... Okay. Here we go. David said, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seats of scoffers. Another translation will have it scorners. Other translations will have it mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates both day and night. Now, what does this person's life look like that trusts the Lord? Here's what his life will look like or hers. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That brings forth fruit, a fruit, a tree rather, that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does or she does will what? Prosper. Prosper. Not so for the wicked, David goes on to say. They are like chaff. Now remember what chaff was. When they would take wheat and they would gather wheat from the fields, they would bring it onto what's called the threshing floor. And either with an instrument called a winnowing fork or with an oxen that would basically drag around a huge stone behind it, what it would do is it would separate the wheat from the stalk of the wheat or the useless part of the wheat, and that was called chaff. Then they would take it, after it was crushed, they would take it with this, with this winnowing fork, which is basically like a huge rake, 
and they would take it and they would throw it up in the air and somebody else would be there with something called a fan. And a fan was like a big bellows. And so, and they would blow. So when you threw it up in the air, they would blow the chaff away and the only thing heavy enough to fall straight down would be the good wheat. Now, in absence of the bellows, if you will, they would wait for a very windy day and then they would do their work of winnowing. It's called winnowing. All right, so when you talk about chaff, chaff is the useless part of a crop or a plant. However, I want you to notice something else about chaff. Chaff was at one time useful. Chaff was at one time part of the productive process. Now, how many of you know that some things in our life are good for a season and then they're no longer necessary? There are things in our life that we've got to lose if we want to gain something new. And it doesn't mean they were bad, but they no longer fit into the good season of life. Now, in this case, it's all bad, he said, because unlike the blessed person, the person that follows the Lord, he said, it's not going to be a good situation for the wicked when they draw their last breath. They're like the chaff that the wind will blow away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. That means in the holy place where, um, where the faithful people will be judged in the proper way and sent on to be with the Lord. He said the righteous, the wicked, I'm sorry, the wicked will not stand in that place of judgment. They're going to stand at something called the white throne judgment. The judgment seat of Christ is where believers will go to be judged by Jesus. That will essentially be all right, let's examine your life and let's see what kind of rewards are coming your way based upon what? Faithfulness and living sacrificially for him. But this other place of judgment is called the white throne judgment. That white throne judgment will be reserved for sinners. You won't find any believers at the white throne judgment, nor will you find any sinners at the judgment seat of Christ. There are two different judgments completely with two different purposes in mind. The judgment seat of Christ is primarily for the dishing out, doling out of rewards to the faithful. The white throne judgment will be to judge what? Sin and rebellion, and as well as somebody's works and how they behaved in life, and that's not going to be a good place. He said, therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. And I love this last sentence here. He said, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now, we'll get to all the good stuff in just a second. All right, so here we go. Our view of God is really important as we try to understand the book of Psalms. The truth of the matter is this. The Lord is really delighted when he sees that his children are happy. Now, is this, is this some kind of shallow, self-serving gospel? No. The Lord gets delight in blessing us. The Lord takes delight in blessing us. How many of you know that it doesn't matter how much we pray, that if you really wanted to get down to the nitty-gritty, none of us would be deserving of even one answered prayer. And yet he does it anyhow. Over and over and over again. If his love for us was based upon performance or works, not even solely, but even on a primary basis, we'd all be in trouble. Yet he blesses us anyhow. He loves us anyhow. Why? Because he sees us through the lens of his son and what Jesus has purchased for us. So thank God for him. And so in light of that, it says in Psalm 35, verse 27, for example, that the Lord takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. He takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. The Lord takes pleasure in prospering his servants. Are you a servant of the Lord tonight? Then the Lord takes pleasure in prospering you. So guess what? Expect to prosper. Expect to prosper. Now, if you're going to be selfish with the prosperity, don't expect it. Then expect a two by four on the heels of the prosperity. Because if he prospers you, he's testing you to see what you will do at the next level of blessing. 
If he prospers you, he wants to see what you will do with that. If you keep it and invest in yourself, then you're becoming a dead seed. All inputs, no outlets. But if he, if he can prosper you and he says, you know what? Not only did this person increase their standard of living, they've also increased their standard of giving. That's someone that I can trust at a higher level. Then you'll see more prosperity coming on you. Promotions and favor, et cetera, et cetera. Don't get quiet on me now. I don't want to mention the word giving and everybody has, has to take anti-anxiety medication. Don't it? I'm telling you, this is God's economic plan. This is his plan. This is not my plan. This is his plan. Do it his way. Get his results. If not, the Lord saying we can find happiness if we follow these procedures, if you will. And again, this is not some cheesy little set of uh, a cheesy little formula. This is, these are real Bible principles. So let's get going together. All right. Now he says in verse 3, which is right in the center of the passage we just read, that our lives, when the blessing of the Lord is on it, can be equated to, with a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. Now let's check it out one more time. It says our lives will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams or the rivers of water, and we will be like a tree, our lives will be like a tree that bears fruit or yields fruit in what? Not every season, but in its appointed season. Now, are we supposed to bear fruit all the time? Well, spiritually speaking, I suppose we should always be sharing the gospel with someone and we can always be doing things spiritually, but there'll be seasons in our life that will be marked by a tremendous outward expression maybe of prosperity or of spiritual usability, spiritual fruitfulness, but not every season of our life is going to be filled with that. Any more than summer in New England looks like winter in New England. It's a radically different landscape of life. And guess what, though? In the dead of winter in New England, like last winter, life went on. You understand that? The trees, the plants. I'm telling you, I looked at my shrubs and trees in front of my house, and I said, last winter, after the 95th time of snow blowing, I said, there's just nowhere to put anything anymore. There's just nowhere else to put the snow. So it just kept going <laughs> higher and higher, and the wind is ripping. And, you know, and every time I thought the wind had settled down, it was always the north wind. And it would come right back in my face. <laughs> Oh, but I looked at the shrubs. They're absolutely buried in snow. I said, it's going to be a miracle if any one of these things survive. And almost everyone survived. One of them, we had to put it to sleep. But, <laughs> but we had to put it down. <laughs> but all in all, why? Why is that? Because the Lord has built into the structure of the branches and the trunk and the roots and the root system that it goes down and it finds what it needs to. I remember reading something not too long ago <clears throat> talking about seeds and, and crops and, and soil. And in this particular article, the guy was saying how he instructs kids, this was a Midwestern, in a Midwestern high school, he instructs future farmers kind of people on, on crops and things like that, prepares them for college when they're actually going to college to, to specialize in those things. And he said a very simple kind of off-the-cuff lesson was, he said, I want you to plant something, and when you plant it, give it very little water at first, just make sure it doesn't die, especially if it's really hot out. And then leave it alone. And some of the students were like, what, what do you mean leave it alone? He said, leave it alone. When you leave it alone, it forces those root systems, once they're secured, to dig, dig deep and find resources. 
Now, the guy was saying that when people overwater, they actually kill the plants. Not only do they kill them, but if you don't kill them, you almost send them into shock because they don't have to work for what belongs to them. Oh, man, you see the principle here? You see what's already going on? That's from a tomato plant, guys. The Lord has, he has lessons and instruction from everything from the animal kingdom to the agricultural kingdom and according to Psalm 18 from creation itself. Psalm 8. Wow. And you read Romans chapter 1. It says everything about God's invisible attributes can be seen, detected, and dissected from what? Creation itself. Of course, you have to be thinking at that level, beyond your remote, beyond your iPhone. So it's going to take some work. And so, in other words, the psalmist is saying it this way. People that are happy, successful, blessed, from heaven's perspective or according to God's design, will be like a tree that's firmly planted by a source that consistently nourishes us. And our lives yield a harvest of fruit. Now, I think the interesting part about it, that it says, and our leaves will never wither. Now, I just had a, we had one of our shrubs. The leaves were withering. They were all kind of rolled up. You know, and they got all skinny and rolled up. It was looking pretty sick. And then Brian Miller came over to do something, and of course, Brian's an expert at this stuff. And he said, you know why this tree does this? I said, no, is it dead? He said, no, it's not dead, but get this. He said, God has built it in such a way that it goes into self-preservation mode. And when it kind of rolls up its leaves like that, it's trying to actually preserve itself from the sun. How crazy is that? But in the meantime, the roots are digging for all their worth to find any kind of nutrients and any kind of water that's deep under the soil. He said, but we'll give it a hand today. Well, he watered it, and all of a sudden, it unrolled, and it was like, yes! <laughs> Finally, some idiot watered me. <laughs> the owner's notwithstanding. <laughs> I said, oops. <laughs> Now, I mean, who thinks about their shrubs? I don't have time to think about their shrubs all the time. But I love it. It says when the Lord is nourishing us, when our root systems go down by the rivers of life, our leaves will never wither. And I promise you this. In this world, there's a whole lot of people whose leaves are withering because of hopelessness, because of pain, because of divorce, because of all kinds of problems in life. And guess what the Lord has in store for the believer? The believer is supposed to be a dealer in hope to a broken world. But in order to do that, our leaves can't wither just like the world's. We've got to have something going on that goes beyond the barrenness and the drought in this world. We've got to have something going on spiritually. When you get something going on spiritually, you know where it's going to manifest? It's going to manifest in your emotional realm. It's going to manifest in how you think, which will ultimately manifest in how you operate and do life. Hello, you with me? When you are doing well spiritually, you're going to start to do well emotionally. You can't look for your emotions first. You've got to look for your spiritual condition first. Because you can only do so much in your emotional realm. If you concentrate on your emotional realm... You're actually setting yourself up for failure. Oh, how? I'm glad you asked. Here's how. If you concentrate primarily on your emotional realm, you're concentrating on something that is subject to circum outward circumstances for its stability. Listen, I don't know about you, but when things are going well for me, I feel really leveled out emotionally. When things all, all of a sudden, the bottom falls out because of a circumstance, a tragedy, or a heartache, a disappointment, guess what goes with that? Your emotions go right down the drain for that day or two or three or whatever it is 
until you can pull yourself up out of that and start to level out. Anybody with me? So if you spend your time trying to deal with your emotions, you're actually, you're actually feeding into a mechanism that's in itself subject to outward circumstances. However, if you choose to beef yourself up spiritually, the spiritual part of you is what can overcome your emotions quickly. Even if your emotions take a slide, if your spirit is strong, it can pull your emotions up. But if your spirit's not strong, your emotions are going to take the lead. And when you're down on the canvas, you're going to be down for a while. But if your spirit is strong, great things will come out of that. You know, it says in, in Proverbs in a couple different places that if a person's spirit is strong, it could even sustain them through the deepest, darkest times of sickness and infirmity. But in another proverb, it says, but... Uh, a wounded spirit who can bear. That when your spirit is broken, feels like your life is broken. See, these are powerful truths. And so we've got to concentrate on building ourselves up spiritually. Listen to me. Things that have happened to you in your life have actually formed a, th a thought pattern of how you see life. It's almost like, I remember reading this study one time, that when somebody concentrates on something all the time, and this was particularly a negative situation where they were doing a study of um, uh, patients that, that really struggle with depression, true depression, and the, the closest equivalent that they could bring from the conclusive nature of the study was this. That when you thought about negative things all the time, because that was the rule of thumb for your life, it almost was the equivalent of water being run down into, let's say, a little trough in a certain way for a long, such a long period of time that it actually drew a, uh, a rut. The water going over the same old ground over and over again actually created a literal rut. And anything that got near that rut actually fell into the rut and was taken downstream. That's how powerful the thought pattern and process became. That a person's thoughts ran out of control. They lost control of their thoughts when that rut was established of negative thinking. In their brainstem. Some of you are struggling with some degree of that tonight. You might say, well, every week you're having thoughts that are bringing you up or down. Every week you're wrestling within yourself with the same old stuff. You have to realize where that's coming from. It's coming from an old pattern that has actually now captivated you and captured you and you are captive to that unless and until you put your foot down and break it. I'm just telling you the truth. It's like someone that needs to be encouraged every single day that they look good. And the day you forget, their lives are crushed. All of a sudden they want to leave. Maybe my time here is done. You don't like me anymore. And you're like, huh? What, where is this coming from? What did I do? What, what, uh, what didn't I do? Well, you walked by and didn't say hello to me, so I figure you're through with me now. Maybe my time is through here. What? You see what I'm saying? And you chew on that for days or weeks. You really believe that that's accurate. You really believe that that's the truth. And in fact, in reality, nothing could be farther from the truth. Now, if that has happened to you more than once, you need to stop believing yourself. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm telling you the truth. You need to stop believing what you're thinking. You need to stop. Tell the devil where to go. Kick your own self in the behind. And then come and ask the question. Do you still like me? Yeah. Well, you, why, why do you ask? You didn't say hello to me last week. I still like you. If it'll help you, I'll say hello to you twice today. You understand what I'm saying? That's how you get the victory. One incident at a time. Stop it. The devil is using the same old insecurities to run you ragged and to rob joy, rob you from peace of mind, and get you, get your life like a balloon that the air has just been let out of. No direction, no purpose, but blowing a lot of hot air. Now, we like to think that these victories come, these great victories come at bargain prices. In other words, by not employing stuff, solutions that I just suggested to you. Let me tell you, it's not true. You want big victories? Be prepared to pay a big price. You want little victories? It's going to cost you little to get it. Well, we're talking about a life-controlling, devil-inspired thought process that has your life going like this. And the most destructive part of that whole scenario is that maybe 5% of the entire picture that you see is remotely accurate. If only 5% is accurate, that means what you're seeing is 95% manipulated. So why are you going to believe it then? Again, if it happened to you more than once or even more than twice, it's a pattern. Now, have I made mistakes with these things? Absolutely. But guess what I've tried to do with it? Ask the right person the right question and get the matter settled. But when I just sit and think and sit and think and I have all these dark scenarios in my mind and dark reasonings and, all that, and I arrive at these conclusions and there's the devil. It's like when you're starting a fire out in the, in the wilderness. And the devil's saying, let me help you with that. And he runs roughshod over the life of a believer because they have not taken every thought captive. They know the scripture. They know the verse. They can quote it. They say amen to it, but they don't do it. They think in order to apply that verse, it's if the devil appears in your bedroom and he tells you something and you say, in Jesus' name, get away from me, I got to take those thoughts captive. No, that's an extreme example. And when's the last time the devil ever appeared in your bedroom? I'm not even going to go any farther with that. <laughs> <Not even. laughs> no, I'm not going there. I'm, I, okay. Okay, so. Here we go. Ready? Let's go to the four keys to finding happiness life. We'll do one. You'll have to figure the other three out. But, uh, Again, now, if you want to sit and think, think about that. <laughs> At least it's something positive to think about. All right. Here we go. Ready? Key number one is this. Be willing to be different. Be willing to be different. And what do I mean by be different? I mean be different in the world's eyes. You see, you're never going to be a person like the psalmist is referring to. Primarily, what it says right under point number one, Psalm 1, verse 1. It said, blessed is the person who does three things. Number one, refuses to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Number two, refuses to stand in the path of sinners. And number three, refuses to sit 
in the seat of the scoffer or the mocker. Now, I'm going to explain what those things mean in just a second. But just very loosely, this is what that whole thing means. It means refusing to listen to people that are loose morally and unstable in their own right, who separate themselves from the laws of God and are not, do not subjugate themselves to God's law, God's truth. He said, don't, don't get too involved with somebody like that. Be careful where that counsel is coming from. Be careful what you listen to that they have to say. Be careful that you don't take advice from someone who doesn't even know the Lord. Other than in a very limited context. If I go to a doctor and I know he's not a Christian or she's not a Christian, am I going to take advice from them? Yes. In most cases. But guess what? There is a context. The context is, should I do this or should I do that? And in my opinion, you know, you're probably struggling with this problem, but we have a solution for it. That's the context in which I'm going to listen to that person. Hello? I'm not going to ask the doctor if we can hang out. Now, I, I've defined these words for you to just make it easy. So we'll, we'll kind of divide this verse into three little chunks. Ready? He said, blessed is the person who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Okay? So there's the first little chunk. And I've defined the three words that really make that phrase go. Walks, counsel, and ungodly. So here's what he's saying there. Blessed is the person, and you see where it says walks. It means to walk with. But listen to the second definition. It means to be conversant with. It means someone that you talk to. Maybe it's a coworker. Somebody that you talk to. Okay? And it means to engage somebody, primarily in conversation. Now, the counsel, this word counsel means advice, plans, wisdom, and ways. So we'll define these words, then we'll put it back together. And then the word ungodly. Does it mean they're a Satan worshiper? Absolutely not. Where's what it means? It means somebody who is morally wrong, someone who is not morally aligned with God's word. See, there's a lot of moral people in this world, but if their morality is not linked to God's truth, they're going to derail in their morality. Their morality cannot be sustained without a spiritual base to it. It's like building a house on sand. Hello? For example, there are people in our society that used to believe 10, 15, 20 years ago, that certain sins were wrong or certain lifestyles or behaviors were wrong. Now they say, I've changed. Well, if you really believed it was morally reprehensible 20 years ago, what changed about that? From God's standpoint, nothing changed. Sin was sin 20 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years from now, and it's still sin to him today. So you see, my moral, my moral compass can only be stabilized and reset and recalibrated if I have a spiritual foundation holding it up. Because otherwise, well, uh, I'm, just a, I'm just a moral person. No, you're not. You think you are. Because your compass will move next year when there's enough social pressure put on you. Look at how people get bullied around by the liberal media. They say one thing out of line. The media dogs them, spanks them. They start to lose sponsors because everybody wants to, wants to rush to judgment. They want to divest themselves of anyone who's closed-minded, intolerant, bigoted, <laughs> politically incorrect. They want to run from them like they have leprosy. Why? Because that's the in thing to do. They believe that that's the morally right thing to do. Not even considering whether the person's opinion is actually more accurate than theirs. So you see what I'm saying? Someone who is ungodly is someone who is morally wrong. By God's standards, not by mine or yours. And they are morally wrong because of the second part of the definition. Having little to no regard for God and his commandments. So there you go. That pretty much puts a lot of people by definition into this box. So therefore, what David is saying here is, blessed is the person who does not get too engaged or too conversant with 
or take advice or plans from someone who is morally wrong or incompatible in their lives with God's truth. Other than in a given context. If you go to an auto mechanic and you know this guy is not a Christian, he's going to tell you about what? Life? Well, he might try to, but tell him you're not interested in his definition of life. You're interested in your definition of your car's problem. That's what you're paying him for. That's the context in which you are conversant with him. Now, it's a whole different thing of you working with a coworker or hanging out with a next door neighbor, someone who's filled with barstool wisdom, right? And they're starting to mock you for being a Christian. They're starting to draw someone who is uh, kind of subject to social pressure, or maybe it's a family uh, member who wants to draw you away from really following Jesus, and they want you back in religion. Then you ask them, why do you want me back in religion? So what? you don't even go. And they say, well, what does that have to do with it? You understand, it really makes a lot of sense. So he said, you're blessed if you don't get your advice and counsel from someone who's not lined up with God's word. Number two, he said, you're blessed if you refuse to stand in the path of sinner. That word stand means to dwell with and to abide with. Can you see now, instead of just walking with somebody, now you're stopping, you're standing. Can you see this progression? you got to be careful who you walk with because sooner or later you might stand with them. To stand with somebody, it means to dwell with and abide with. Now you're spending more time than just having to be a coworker. And the word sinners means someone, this is a literal Hebrew definition, someone who is a spiritual criminal, a refugee, I'm sorry, someone who you're harboring a refuge from God's justice. Someone who's a spiritual criminal. They are wanted by the FBI of heaven. Why? Because they're an offender of God's laws. That means they're not in right standing with the Lord. Why would you want to stand with, abide with, and dwell with someone who does not stand with the Lord? Now we're talking about choosing to spend quality time with someone, listening to what they have to say, and they're not even right with the Lord. Okay, so now we're from walking, now we stopped, now we're standing. Let's move to the next level of decline. Sit in the seat that's actually owned by a scoffer, a mocker. All right, so let's define these words. To sit means to sit down, and it means emotionally to marry someone. The word seat means a habitation. Maybe you're going over their house now, and you're literally sitting in their house. And the word scoffer means someone who mocks, someone who makes fun of, and someone who uh, moves in derision. That means to mock somebody else and to make fun of somebody. So now he's saying, you're blessed if you don't walk with a certain person, dwell with a certain person. Then he said, if you go to the next level, you're actually sitting down, you are emotionally marrying yourself to the opinions of someone who actually mocks the things of God, even though they may like you as a person, they mock the things of God. What fellowship does light have with darkness? So do you understand this, this negative description that we're talking about here really denotes the moral decline that a person can experience when they begin to listen to the wrong advice, then they proceed to acting the wrong way, and there is this whole thing results in becoming the wrong kind of person. It's a powerful, powerful process here of decline if we're not careful who we listen to. Listen, I don't know about you, but I'm really careful who I listen to. How about you? You should be really careful. I don't mean you should be aloof and not being able to relate to people and they can't relate to you. That, that just makes you weird. I'm talking about someone who's wise and discerning. There's enough weird people. Let's, let's move in love and let's move in wisdom. So you have to know. Listen, 
Listen to me. I don't care if it's a family member. I don't care if it's a brother, a sister, an aunt, an uncle, or your own son or daughter. If they are not serving the Lord, they are not coming from the same place of understanding whatsoever. Am I saying don't love them? Absolutely not. I'm not saying that. But be careful the level of engagement that you have. Is that understandable? Didn't I? Because we're talking about a spiritual reality here that's absolutely inescapable. I'm careful who I listen to. I mean, there are guys at the gym. There's just something not, there's just something wrong with them. <laughs> there's a lot of things wrong with a lot of people, but <laughs> I mean, there are certain people that just, I don't even like their spirit. I don't like, I don't like every other word out of their mouth is a foul word. I mean, these guys think they sound intellectual and tough by swearing every other word. You just sound dumb, actually. I mean, it just br kind of just brings you down. Doesn't make you seem intelligent, that's for sure. Now, the toughness part is debatable, but intelligent, no, that's, that ship sailed. Um, so, there are some guys, though, they're beyond what, what I would consider normal. I mean, I've been around guys my whole life, but there are some that just, mm -mm. I don't even want to be around this person because what comes out of them is so, so foul. And uh, so I'm just careful. I want to be around positive people. How about you? I want to be around positive people. Now, is everybody positive? Woo, no. And the, but the person that's not positive, as long as they're not foul, I'm trusting the Lord that I can be just a person in their life that can maybe help lift them up a little bit, help encourage them a little bit. You know, put a hand on their shoulder. Give them a good word. Help them, you know, let's say in the context of the gym, just help them with something there that they're trying to do at the gym. Just be an encouragement. That's being a light in a dark place because you don't know what dark place that person is walking through. Right? So, come on, let's stand together.